1964, the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo was the fourth medical school to be chartered in the state of Ohio and the 100th medical school to be chartered in the United States. At that time, there was a nationwide shortage of physicians, and the new medical college would develop the skills of doctors, nurses, and other health professionals in Northwest Ohio. People were aware that we needed to expand the health care force, if you like, and the number of physicians that needed to be created, educated, was growing. Uh, in that period, there was a, a perceived, I believe real, but also a perceived uh, physician shortage, particularly in family medicine, so that was sort of an emphasis. Uh, it grew out of the original GP, general practitioner, from the earlier years in the last century. At that point, there were three medical schools, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio State in Columbus, and then the University of Cincinnati, College of Medicine in Cincinnati. And all three of those institutions at that time were quality programs and had wonderful reputations. But the numbers of medical graduates that they were graduating was not sufficient to address um, the increasing population in our area and also the aging population. This conversation happened in civic quarters that we need a medical school and there were sort of a um, alignment of constellations um, that the medical community, uh, the Blade, and the local political leadership came together. Uh, and started the process of asking for a medical school. Well, when I go back to those early people who had the vision, uh, the Block family, for example, uh, they were visionary. They saw within the city of Toledo and Northwest Ohio the need to educate physicians who could feel this region. And if you look at the number of physicians in Toledo and our immediate environs who've had education at the then MCO, then MUO, and now University of Toledo, it's huge, it's an impact. But to start from scratch is almost unbelievable. One man had the vision to make the unbelievable real. Paul Block Jr. was co-publisher of the family-owned newspaper, The Blade. My father, Paul Block Jr., was born in New York City. Uh, his father, Paul Block Sr., had been born in Germany of um, Jewish parents, uh, who were originally from Lithuania, near East Prussian border. Paul Block Sr. had built a nationwide media empire based in New York City, with significant newspaper holdings in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Toledo, Ohio. He wanted his sons to carry on his legacy in the media industry, but Paul Block Jr. had a variety of interests beyond the newspaper business. After graduating from, from Yale University, he, uh, he was uh, in revolt against my grandfather. And he didn't want to enter the, enter the media business. And he wanted to study uh, to, uh, for a chemistry degree, an uh, organic chemistry degree. Well, he believed in uh, medical research and he believed in science. His own research had taken him through several institutions of, of learning. And, and while he was in the chemistry department, at Harvard and then at Columbia University and, and, and then where he re received a PhD in organic chemistry in 1943. Paul Block Jr. moved to Toledo in order to take the helm at the blade. His brother William was based in Pittsburgh at the Post-Gazette. Paul Block Jr. became a tireless advocate for Northwest Ohio and eventually found a balance between his role as co-publisher of The Blade and his love of science, healthcare research, and organic chemistry. He was normally working in his lab at all kinds of odd hours. Um, he had a telephone in his chemistry lab connected to The Blade. He could be watching a reaction run in his lab or taking a melting point uh, in his lab and be talking to the Blade about an editorial at the same time. Uh, he was not going to be just, just a businessman and I would say in his own mind he wasn't primarily a businessman. He was a journalist and so you know 
as the leader of the blade, he felt that he was serving the community and trying to do good in this community. And, you know, in 1945, there was Toledo Tomorrow. A group of Toledo citizens with the general welfare of their city and its future in mind began developing a master plan which would retain all the good and eliminate all the bad and make Toledo an ideal city of efficiency and beauty. The Toledo Tomorrow Committee engaged the country's foremost experts to develop a practical plan to make their idea a reality. After exhaustive study and preliminary designing, a 61-foot model of Toledo Tomorrow was constructed, complete in every detail and accurately scaled at one inch to every 100 feet of the actual city. Bridges, old and new, occupy their proper positions. And there is a designated place for every building, from the smallest home to the largest office building. The Blade sponsored this model city of the future, and within its bold vision of a thriving and prosperous Northwest Ohio, Paul Block Jr. had a strong desire to build a medical school providing health care, modern technology, and the latest research to the people of Toledo. A design for success and better living in Toledo tomorrow. There was a committee uh, that had been appointed by Mayor Michael Damas around 1960 to look into the possibility of having a medical school uh, in Toledo. The governor of Ohio is from Toledo, Ohio. It's not a normal thing to, to you know, not support for re-election the local governor. But the local governor had not done anything for Toledo. Um, I mean, his best chance, of, he thought, was of getting re-elected was to play to Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Columbus the three C's before that term, you know, those were the three C's even before the term was known. Toledo's own Michael DeSalle was the Democratic governor in 1958, and Paul Block Jr. was frustrated with what he felt was DeSalle's neglect of the Toledo area. Block decided to meet with DeSalle's opponent in the election, Republican candidate James Rhodes. Jim Rhodes asked him, what does Toledo need? My father told Jim Rhodes that what Toledo needs is a medical college. Rhodes, uh, uh, agreed that Toledo could have a, a medical school and without his support there would not have been a medical school and my father was uh, very happy about that. The Toledo Blades supported Rhodes successful bid to become governor of Ohio and the medical school committee members continued a robust working relationship with the Rhodes administration. In December of 1964 the Ohio legislature unanimously passed a bill that created the medical college and the newly appointed Board of Trustees asked Paul Block, Jr. to be the first chairman of the board. You know, he felt it was basically a conflict of interest to be uh, serving on a board, leading a board, in the news, and then the Blade is reporting the news, uh, and he's the head of the Blade. So he, he didn't like it, but he did it a few times in his life um, when, 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 when he thought he could provide um, a leadership that no one else might be capable of. It was extraordinary to have that strong a person who was passionate and committed and really understood along the way what it really took in order to go from a cornfield to a first-class institution. My father would not claim he was the founder of the movement. He would claim that he was the one who carried the ball, though. The Board of Trustees had a great deal to accomplish to get the new school off the ground, and their first order of business was to determine the location of the college. The only easy uh, place where, uh, where, where such a, a large amount of land was available uh, inside the city of Toledo was the old state hospital property. I can remember my father taking me somewhere near Arlington and Detroit and it was a cornfield. My father insisted there's going to be a big campus here. And it's going to, be, you know, buildings will be built and it will rise. In addition to the land, a teaching hospital, offices, and classroom space was required. 
the Lucas County Commissioners voted to lease the Maumee Valley Hospital complex to the college. It's amazing that the people think that when you see a full-fledged, uh, a wonderful landscaped um, institution uh, comprising many, 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 many buildings, they think that perhaps it just materialized overnight. But uh, it was a delightful to see different buildings materializing out of the cornfields. Uh, the classes were started at Maumee Valley Hospital uh, in the William Roche uh, segments uh, building which was dedicated at one time to tuberculosis. And what we had here at Maumee Valley was a very modest um, inpatient unit. Um, so it was a, a different kind of an arrangement. But like a lot of things, it had the right foundation, it had the right community support. Uh, but it was talk of the town. We were getting a new medical school and the new appointments and, and uh, uh, it was also the wedding of uh, uh, the local medical community with the academic community and the cooperation uh, between the two was unprecedented. Uh, actually there was absolutely no uh, no uh, difference or, or the space between town and the gown. In 1965, the Board of Trustees appointed the first employee of the Medical College of Ohio, Miss Annabelle Isaacs, as administrative assistant to the president's office and acting treasurer of the college. Less than a year later, Dr. Glidden Brooks was appointed as the first president. Dr. Brooks came to Toledo from Brown University and his small but growing team occupied rented office space in the Burngate Plaza in South Toledo. Dr. Brooks was the first president of uh, MCO even though he was not around when they started teaching. He was there in the 60s when it was uh, uh, planned and, and no, nobody was more influential as far as you know, what MCO was going to look like or be like than Dr. Brooks. Dr. Brooks and the board recruited Dr. Robert Page of the University of Chicago to helm curriculum development and hire a faculty. The first department chairman to be hired was Dr. Liberato de Dio. He was the first faculty member hired in the medical school and he was a professor of anatomy. Uh, the gentleman had, at that time, national and international reputation as a superb anatomist. And the deal, in, in my view, was one of, the, um, one of the most important linchpin of that early development. Recruitment of the staff was in full swing. The medical college, as a new school, offered potential faculty a future they could help shape and develop. And we were looking at a place that would give us the opportunity to make a difference, to be educators as well as clinicians and scientists, but to also have a good personal quality of life. And, we looked in Chicago and back on the East Coast and such. And Toledo, for some reason, just caught the fire. When we came here, uh, it wasn't what it is today. The hospital didn't exist. It was a hole in the ground. Dr. Morris Manning was working at McGill University in Montreal when he received a call from his former mentor in biochemistry, Dr. Murray Saffron, who asked him to join the MCO team. And I said, well, where's Toledo? <laughs> you know, I, uh, and what kind of school is it? He said, well, it's not. The school isn't there yet. The school is going to be built on a cornfield. <laughs> and he said, the chairman of the board happens to be a PhD in chemistry, and his name is Block. But even although it was new, there were some amazing faculty here. I mean, when you think about who was here, uh, Dr. William Blakemore was here in surgery, Dr. Patrick Mulrow in medicine, Dr. James Patrick in pathology. They were amazing people. Dr. Page and Dr. Glidden Brooks, who was the president, had assembled, uh, and, and I was one of the last uh, chairmen uh, to be recruited, uh, had assembled a, a, an eclectic group of enthusiastic people who were interested in, in trying to do this thing. As the staff came together, a vision for the future campus was also taking shape under the leadership of Paul Block, Jr. Architects were not um, an, an area that he was particularly knowledgeable about, but uh, my um, uncle, William Block, who lived in Pittsburgh, um, was quite knowledgeable about um, art 
and uh, knew quite a bit about architecture. And so one day he told my father, you have one of the world's most famous architects near you. And he was referring to Minoru Yamasaki, a Japanese American who, uh, who had been born in Seattle, but he, his firm was based in Troy, Michigan. And he was the designer of uh, the World Trade Center towers. In 1967, Block drove to Troy, Michigan to meet with Yamasaki and Associates with his son, John Robinson, who was 12 years old at the time. We went to lunch and there was a business manager for the firm and he was a very aggressive kind of guy and very um, uh, hard selling. And he was doing all the talking. He seemed, sound, seemed so important. Later on the drive back to Toledo, I said to my father, and he never forgot this, um, who was that little Japanese man at lunch? Well, of course, I thought that the business manager who was uh, pushing so hard was the head of the firm. He seemed like the big shot. And uh, Yamasaki uh, was quiet um, and uh, did not seem like a big shot to uh, my father's young son. So he loved that story. My father very much uh, disliked show-offs. He liked the idea that Yamasaki was so quietly brilliant that his young son um, didn't think he was uh, the big man in the room. And of course, he was as quiet as he was. He was the big, biggest man it could be in any room as far as architects at, at, uh, at that time. It would be three years before the groundbreaking ceremony was held for the first new campus building. In the meantime, the new faculty and administration would do their best to utilize the buildings at the Maumee Valley Hospital. And, and we didn't have the, the established campus that exists today, okay? There, there was essentially uh, Maumee Valley Hospital. The building that we had for the, for the Department of Pathology and the, and the laboratory was, was the oldest building of the entire uh, complex. When I came back for my second interview, I met with Dr. Patrick, and um, I asked to see the coagulation laboratory. Well, it turned out that what it was was a little water bath, which is, is like a tiny bathtub about this, you know, two feet square, that was not exactly working too well, and one little instrument. So it was less than a yard of counter space in the old then Maumee Valley Hospital laboratories. And it uh, sort of caught my breath. I thought, oh my, <laughs> this is the laboratory, really. Mm. So I asked him if there would be any possibility that we could build that, we could grow on that. And he was incredibly generous. He said, if you can do it, we'll do it. You know, this is a brand new, nobody had ever done this before. It's a total new experiment. And you couldn't, you know, like most experiments, if it doesn't work, you can throw them out if you're a scientist. But this experiment, you had to go forward with. So, you know, would it work? How is this? And then, overlaying all this was this concept of the three-year curriculum. That was the big thing, because Bob Page, who had been hired as the dean, was an expert in curriculum. Originally, the idea was to try to be able to carry students through medical school as quickly as possible. Um, and it was tough. And there also, it's, it's, it's valuable for people to have regular rest. And medical students work hard. And it is good for learning, and it's good for your mental health and your social health. And if you're married, it's awfully good for a marriage to have a little time off. <laughs> the three-year program would attract medical students from all over the nation. And soon, MCO would open its doors to those future doctors. The school was also developing an innovative nursing program in partnership with other universities in Northwest Ohio. We are so closely located, the University of Toledo and Bowling Green, that it would have been a complete loss if only one of them had, uh, had the nursing program. Dr. Ruth Alternator spent her career teaching future nurses and helping to build MCO's nursing program. Nursing was its own profession and needed to be accepted as a profession uh, and not just as helpers in the, for the physician's orders. 
in a, a clinical area. It was a freestanding health science university with multiple disciplines. Uh, disciplines in nursing, uh, most uh, saliently perhaps, uh, disciplines in health sciences. The College of Nursing is uh, uh, populating uh, every hospital in Northwest Ohio. So those disciplines uh, are, were an important part of a freestanding health science university and now are a very important and integral part of uh, the University of Toledo. Often doctors and nurses worked well together, and just as often they didn't see things eye to eye. However, they could disagree and still like each other, a lot. Well, I met my wife and she was a nursing student at Maumee Valley Hospital. Uh, I was a resident, she was a nursing student, and when we met, I don't believe there are any sparks with flu. And if there were any sparks, they were because we disagreed and fought about things and they were professional things. And as I had said that, that I, a brash young resident from Pakistan, believed that the doctors gave orders and the nurses faithfully carried them out. And my future wife uh, thought, no, her responsibility is not to me as a physician, but to her patients. So she was a patient advocate and we clashed. So finally we decided, you know, it's not gonna work. Uh, so why don't we get married and don't talk about medicine? <laughs> as MCO geared up to teach its first class of students, the leadership was changing. Dr. Glidden Brooks announced he was stepping down, and Dean Robert Page was interested in the job. But Page was the guy who was in charge day to day and was involved with hiring the chairman and, and making sure the curriculum was working well. But he was also a very polished guy. He was a nice guy. He was, uh, you know, very... But he ran into some, I think, problems with Paul Block, I mean, if you really want to know. Because Paul didn't, he was, Paul had a thing about some MDs. He thought they were a bit arrogant. So, you know, it wasn't good to be arrogant with him. But, but, but he, he had a tendency to be a little bit arrogant. The job of president went instead to Dr. Marion Anderson, the chairman of surgery at the medical college. A few years prior, Dr. Umjit Hussain was called into Anderson's office and was offered a position on the faculty. And I said, I'm sorry, but uh, I am going back to Pakistan. So he asked me a questions, which were very interesting. He said, so you have a job there? I said, no, I don't. And he said, so you, they promise you a job. And I said, no. Uh, you will be able to get a job. And I said, I do not know. So he leaned forward in his chair and looked at me. And he says, you have to be a damn fool. I'm offering you an academic position and you are going to an unknown future. And he stopped and he smiled and he says, if it doesn't work out, come back and call me, which I did. In 1969, the facilities at the old Maumee Valley Hospital and William Roche Tuberculosis Center had been updated for the college. The curriculum was now in place and it was time for the new faculty to teach their first class of students. Well, when we started medical school, we had uh, in 19, 69, the first class, 32 students and 69 or 70 faculty. And so you can think there's, many of those were basic scientists. So the need for clinical faculty, those that could talk to us about patients was great. Uh, the involvement of the Toledo community was stellar. Doctors took half days out of their offices, brought patients in from out of town, and let us ask them questions about their thyroid disease or examine their goiter. It, it was truly an extraordinary experience, and I think we all remember those first patients that helped us learn about medicine. We had an extraordinary class, and of course the charter class is always going to think we were the most special, and of course I think we were too. We were from all over the country. We. Um, we were full of, of, of three things, I think. It was, there was the exhilaration that we'd had that in, impressive letter that we had been accepted into this class. And excitement, of course, and then absolute fear. We were going into a place where we had no upperclassmen to help us, to, to teach us, to mentor us. The first faculty member to be hired, Dr. Liberato Di Dio, was slated to give the first lecture on the first day to the first class of students at the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo. 
he really wanted to explain to the students that the history of medicine is tied into the history of art and he gave this wonderful lecture showing how that was so and I think it made a big impact on that first class. I mean, if you talk to any of them, I'm sure they all remember that lecture. The setting was this. We were in a um, fairly newly built laboratory building, a single story brick building with cement floors, uh, sitting in our little folding chairs um, in lines at tables. I think some of the medical students were smoking. Um, and there were people, a lot of people, who weren't medical students standing outside in the hallway because this was the very first lecture. So that was very exciting. Uh, and they kept sneaking in more and more of them. So it was, it was we were in awe. And uh, because obviously once he started talking, you recognize the nature of who he was and, and what, what he could offer. So how could you top that? But in comes a Dr. Ben Pansky. We knew and heard in looking at books we needed for medical school about the one most used in the country, Pansky and House Gross Anatomy. So he comes into the classroom and there were two blackboards in the front of the room and he says, turn out the lights. And appearing above those blackboards were black lights. And in each hand he had a different colored chalk and he started lecturing on the anatomy of the heart and drawing the, with both hands in colored chalk and black light, the anatomy of the heart. So those first two lectures were spectacular. And so, you know, we could have been out in a field and it wouldn't have made any difference uh, because those, those were so good and memorable. So I'm sure all of us remember those. In the beginning, classroom space was very limited. So the students remained in place and the professors traveled to the classrooms and taught in shifts say a, a pathologist would come in and talk about uh, blood clots and, and clotting and then a clinician perhaps from in town would come in perhaps bring a patient with him or her and talk about what happens when you get a blood clot in the lung what laboratory findings you have what findings you have when you examine the patient and so we were able to see patients very early and that was a dream so we get these little white coats, and we're so excited that two of my classmates wore them to the grocery store, which was just down the street from the medical school, and we thought maybe that wasn't appropriate, but uh, we, we were very excited. And the value of having medical students who are in their third and fourth year experience what primary care is like, general internal medicine, gives them insight in establishing a relationship with a quality clinician who wants to share his knowledge or her knowledge with these students. My program um, was in uh, family medicine and that was at here in town at the Toledo Hospital. I was so fortunate having finished uh, there that Dr. Les Huffman, who was the first chair of the Department of Family Medicine here at the Medical College of Ohio asked me if I would like to join him uh, in his practice. That was a very fortunate thing. I stayed here in town. I mean, we were ensconced here in town and then I went into private practice. It was 1972. The long anticipated graduation ceremony had finally arrived. However, some of the students became worried, not about their grades, but about the location of their graduation. And then the rumor went around that we were going to be graduating at Luke's barn at the rec center. And I, I just was heartbroken. I'm bringing my mother out here. My mother, the nurse, who now could say, I hoped, my daughter, the doctor, and we're going to be at Luke's barn. Well, we're not sure it was just a rumor. We think it really was true. But instead, we had a very elegant uh, and impressive ceremony at our wonderful Toledo Museum of Art in the Peristyle and stood on the steps for that very proud picture afterwards. Mm -hmm. There had been uh, a very important piece of that for the ceremonial march made in Toledo, the mace that was carried by Ron Watterson, the librarian. The medical college mace bearing the institution seal was sculpted entirely of glass. It was designed by pioneering studio glass artist and innovator Dominic Labino. I love the College of Medicine graduation and there isn't any more event which is any more uplifting to a professor than to say job well done and look what 
what, how everyone is so thrilled with what has happened. So graduation's a great time. And my proudest moment, of course, when I, Dean Page handed me my diploma, absolutely. But I think afterwards, we had this lovely reception in the Egyptian room at the museum. And my mother was there, and she said, my daughter, the doctor. A few years prior to graduation, groundbreaking on the first new building took place. As the Health Sciences Building rose above the cornfields, a new campus was beginning to take shape. Well, it was a dramatic change physically, of course, to see the plans of Yamasaki <laughs> uh, actually come to fruition. And I would drive by and I'd say, that looks just like an architectural drawing. I can't believe this is really, and being a bit jealous, of course, that we didn't have that. But as I look back, we had just as much fun. And then I was fortunate, I got a nice lab overlooking the front of the building, and it was nice to be able to look out and get a whole different perspective. And one of the other things that happened from the very beginning was that Paul Block, who was a chemist, uh, he, would use, he was interested in some of the equipment in my lab, so he would always come over to use that equipment, and then he would linger, we would make tea, I would make tea for him in the lab, <laughs> and he came on a regular basis right up till the very end to, for a cup of tea, so it was kind of very, he would also come and get some dry ice once in a while for his own lab. But I was very impressed at how he could find the time to do his own experiments. Following on the heels of the Health Sciences Building came the Mulford Health Science Library, a modernist structure that solidified the new look of the growing campus. Yeah, the librarian was Ron Morrison, and he was a real scholar and a real first-rate librarian. And his first big thing was to design the new library. That was part of the big charm of, of the school. As we were settling in on the other campus, then we began to learn about the new buildings over here, and the library was the crown jewel of the early campus. As the college sailed into a building period of growth, a new leader took the helm. In 1977, Dr. Richard D. Rupert became the third president of MCO. He was an amazing man. Um, first of all, he was a builder. He just loved to build buildings and did it. And that campus that we have now, the Health Science Campus, in no small measure reflects his vision. Um, it, if you look at it, it's an exquisite place to work. Uh, I go to medical schools in other cities and they're not very nice, they're not very attractive. And just the environment there that he created for us is wonderful. He was the first Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs at the Ohio Board of Regents. And he was the first person to have that position. And basically what it did was to elevate the colleges of medicine and the health science campuses that were in Ohio. And it also helped formalize what the need was in the state of Ohio for expansion and what it should look like. He was a tough guy. <laughs> he was one of these guys who kind of wouldn't brook much opposition. That, that was his style, so he, it was his way or the highway. But on the other hand, he had a vision for what the school could become and should become. So he pursued that vision with uh, single-minded intensity and got a lot of things done, a lot of uh, accomplishments here. Take the old doctor. You, you recall the painting of the doctor sitting at the bedside of the child, you know, and. In, uh, in the old Norman Rockwell painting. At that time when a picture was taken, if that child had pneumonia, there was a 40% chance the child would die. In today's modern medicine, we come in, make the diagnosis, and give you a shot in, in the side, and, uh, and give you a package of pills and go home, and there's a 96% chance you survive well. No complications. He was an important uh, recruiter of uh, uh, early uh, people in leadership roles. And so I think that uh, Richard Rupert's, uh, Dick Rupert's uh, stamp is on almost everything in what now is the College of Medicine, College of Pharmacy. He, he had a way of energizing people, of getting people sort of involved and on the team and moving forward. He, he didn't like naysayers too well. He wanted people to to figure out a way to make things happen. And he, I don't know how he did it some of the time, but all of a sudden we'd see a new hole in the ground, a new building was going up. He was the person who could see down the line what we really needed. He wasn't worrying about today or tomorrow. He was worrying about 10 or 15 years from now, which was wonderful. He built the faculty very quickly too. He brought in 
high quality chairman. And uh, he did the job. But Dr. Rupert didn't come to MCO alone. His wife, Dr. Elizabeth Rupert, joined the staff in pediatrics. She and I are fairly close to the same age, so we went through medical school when uh, girls didn't do that. And uh, she's just a strong, vibrant individual who continues to teach our students and act as a role model, especially for the young women in our medical school class. The new MCO hospital was about to open its doors, but first, equipment, staff, and most importantly, the patients had to be moved from the old Maumee Valley Hospital facility. And then the day to move came. We, the hospital was done and some of us had been on a tour of it. And, oh, it was spectacular. It was brand new, modern, shiny. We all started somewhere before seven o'clock, somewhere between six and seven in the morning. And it was a Saturday morning. It was cool. It was sunny, there was no rain, and we had prayed that there would not be any rain. And they had to plan the move on a Saturday, lower the census in the hospital to the minimum number of patients, and then make sure the train didn't go across the railway track there and stop a move. I think Tom Martin uh, was the uh, go-to guy. He uh, uh, was head of the chair of the Department of Anesthesia. And he also had a strong military background. So he was, yes, sir. <laughs> My responsibility was to be in the medical intensive care unit on the old campus down there at Maumee Valley and clear the patients medically to go into the trucks. The trucking industry donated drivers and trucks to be able to transport inpatients from the old Maumee Valley Hospital to the new College of Medicine Hospital. So we bundled the patients all up, down the elevators, took them onto the trucks, and I happened to, I went in the last truck, leaving with the last patient from the hospital, and when we went into the lobby of the new hospital, it was magic. And the memory is frozen in my mind of standing in the lobby of the new hospital and the men who volunteered as truck drivers and volunteered their trucks, and all of us, we just celebrated we had done it, and it was before noon. And it was a sunny day, and the beaming of light came in through the lobby, and it was one of, the, one of, the, one of those rare moments where all was right with the world. The campus was growing. New buildings brought new spaces for healing and teaching. Educational programs were also maturing and setting higher standards of quality for the region. At the time, uh, St. Vincent's had a school of nursing. Uh, the diploma nurses were all, that's what was employed pretty much uh, throughout the area. MCO's degreed nurses program had an academic focus and differed from the traditional hospital-based schools, which more resembled apprenticeship programs. We were trying to ensure them that we believed in clinical education, but we also believed that students did not need to work long hours. They needed to have opportunities to take part in uh, collegiate activities, to uh, have time to study, to um, be a part of a university setting. The college was branching out in other ways too, creating unique public service partnerships that better serve the community, like a regional blood bank program. The um, community had kind of a fragmented approach uh, with a lot of individual uh, blood banks, and it seemed to me that, that uh, I had seen how it could work actually both in, in Washington and in Los Angeles, ultimately uh, getting a full-time uh, hematologist blood banker in our community uh, and getting a, a sponsor such as the Red Cross to, to take that over. And, and you know, it's, it, it, it's turned out, I think, uh, to be a, a very, very positive thing for the community. The MCO faculty contributed their resources to the community, 
and local medical professionals did their part to support the college by volunteering their time and talents. Well, our community faculty uh, are essential. For example, every medical student who graduates from UT's College of Medicine and Life Sciences spends time, a good deal of time, with a variety of community practicing physicians, both in the city and in our region through the area health education system. These are people who they give their time with no salary. They give their time because they believe in advancing the education of these young people. And you really have to admire those folks. Genetically, I'm a teacher. I love to teach. Um, and I have had the good fortune of being taught by some great teachers. So I try in a small, minuscule way to carry that legacy with me. Uh, so um, there was no uh, other way but to get involved in teaching, and I did. Full-time faculty members also worked hard to find new and memorable ways to engage the medical students in the classroom. So my philosophy is to make it as unanxious as possible, to kind of smooth the smoother transition from pre-medical to medical and to try to help them realize, well, they can handle the material. And one of the things I do do, which they love uh, over the years, is I sing a song uh, about a biochemical pathway. It's called Waltz Around the Cycle. And every year when I sing that, they love it. If I don't sing it, they say, why didn't you sing the song? You sang it last year. So every year they come, they come at the first or second lecture, I have to sing that song. Once a jolly pyruvate enters the matrix of a mitochondrion, so they say, a decarboxylating complex dehydrogenase converts it to acetyl-CoA. That's how it starts. <laughs> how do you teach a student to be a good doctor if the teacher is not a good doctor? Okay so that we, we, do, we do really emphasize that clinical education. Now, the one thing we do at the medical college, which is not necessarily seen in, in a variety of other community settings, is we more extensively use our, our associated community hospitals, University or at, at, uh, at uh, Toledo Hospital, at St. Vincent's Hospital, Mercy Hospital, Toledo Mental Health Center. We do have students and residents in those settings. It is a regional program. Always looking at the big picture, Dr. Rupert had some very effective community partners to advise the college on all matters, financial and political, as well as develop public service goals. Dick always felt that he had a superior board, always felt it. And he also felt that the board was very helpful in helping him better address um, issues and learning um, quickly through their wise comments about what seems like the best route to go in our community. So it was a very, the board was very valuable. One of the proposals from the medical college was to establish a high technology center which all the hospitals uh, join together and participate in uh, in regard to new technologies. I think there are things we could do collectively together that, is a, that would be a benefit to each of us um, and would improve our image individually and collectively. Dr. Rupert was open to innovative and bold ideas. Rupert supported a plan that would move the Lucas County Coroner's Office onto the campus of the college and even closer to the MCO Pathology Department. We were having a discussion one day about the Coroner's Office and the relationship to medical school and, and uh, uh, the thought came that maybe somebody ought to run for coroner and, and so it turned out to be me and, and Dr. Rupert who was president of the medical school was approached, we approached him with this idea whether it would be appropriate and so on and he was very enthusiastic and said uh, I think that's a great idea and he made it, he made it possible for me to be uh, coroner and retain my faculty position and uh, tenure and all that sort of thing at the medical school uh, and so that, that's how I evolved into being coroner. All students, whether interested in pathology or any specialty, needed to further their education in a residency program. There are thousands of positions in graduate medical education spread across the whole country and across all of these different 
disciplines, medicine, surgery, pediatrics, OB, all lots of them, and thousands of graduates coming out of medical schools. How do you pair those people up in a way that's fair and equitable? The match grew up to try to make this a good process. And the match fundamentally is based on the students creating a list of what they want to do and where they'd like to do it, and the hospital saying, these are the people we want to bring into our educational environment. And in days gone by, it used to be a manual match, and it took days and days and days. Now it's all done by a computer, and it takes minutes and minutes. It's, it's amazing how fast it happens. And then uh, in February, the process starts to gel. The students make their lists. The programs make their list. And then in early March, the computer does its job. So it's, it's an amazing process, and it is, it's really quite fair. In 1993, Dr. Richard Rupert announced his retirement. The longest-serving president of MCO would leave a legacy of service. He completed the Yamasaki plan for the campus and created innovative programs to better serve the people of Northwest Ohio. Dr. Rupert had done a, you know, did, a, did an outstanding job as, as, as president of MCO. He was, he was outstanding. Um, he, he suddenly retired early in my tenure as a trustee, and you know, that was a loss when it happened. Um, I, I consider that Dr. Rupert retired earlier, too early. I would advise young people to go into medicine. I think it's a magnificent occupation, profession, uh, with all of the problems. Uh, I love the practice of medicine. Uh, my, my is very limited now, but I would say if I, there's one time I get relief, it's when I'm practicing medicine and taking care of people. Uh, I, I really think that the medical profession is a superb profession, and I personally feel I owe a lot to the profession. It's been a pleasure. Dr. Richard D. Rupert passed away in 2012. The Rupert Center and most of the campus buildings would serve as a lasting legacy to his time at MCO. The father of the medical school, Paul Block Jr., had died in 1987, and the campus named the Health Sciences Building in his honor. But I think, I think my father set it in the right direction, you know, to, be, to put academics first. Um, to, to, to have high standards. MCO got its start under the leadership of Dr. Glidden Brooks. The college saw the first students graduate while Dr. Marian Anderson served as president. Dr. Richard Rupert oversaw a period of unprecedented growth and community partnerships. After Rupert, Dr. Roger Bones served a short tenure followed by Dr. Frank McCullough, a protege of Rupert's and MCO's medical director. McCullough was a gastroenterologist and a Toledo native who graduated from Scott High School. McCullough served for 10 years as MCO's fifth president, followed by interim president Amir Gohara. I don't think that people knew what MCO was 25, 35 years ago. They know who we are now. You can travel anywhere in this country and people have heard about our school. We are graduating high quality people who are leaders in medicine. They're department chairmen, they're division chairmen, they're getting major grants. Um, we're nationally known. In 2003, Dr. Lloyd Jacobs became the sixth president of the Medical College of Ohio. As a doctor and a medical educator, Jacobs understood that partnerships and community collaboration held the keys to MCO's future. Uh, he is a surgeon. And, uh, but that's, that's only a tiny part of who he is as a person. Uh, if you talk to him, he reads broadly. Um, he's a voracious reader. Um, he's read ancient history, he reads poetry. Well, my belief is, and has been always, I guess, that names are really important. So, like the naming of cats is a particular matter. I think that's T.S. Eliot. And so I think names are important. It speaks to one's identity, speaks to what one strives for. And uh, I was of the opinion that MCO, the Medical College of Ohio, had long since transcended its being a college. It, at that time already, had a College of Nursing, a College of Graduate Studies, and a College of Health Science and Human Services, so it was more appropriately called a university. The Medical College of Ohio then became the Medical University of Ohio. Merger talks soon began with the University of Toledo and its president, Dan Johnson. At the very outset, when a medical school was being contemplated for Northwest Ohio, there was some discussion, at least, 
about it being a part of a college in the University of Toledo. So this was not a new concept. In fact, it was an old concept that I heard about from day one almost. Uh, uh, and uh, interestingly, however, that idea fit very much with the model that I believe is the best model uh, for higher education and health care. I, I have to give credit for that merger also to, to uh, Dan Johnson, but I do not think that the merger would have happened if it was just Dan Johnson. You had to have Lloyd Jacobs there. Dr. Jacobs facilitated the, you know, the possibility and then the reality that, that Medical College of Ohio and the University of Toledo could have become one institution. Certainly from my perspective, the College of Medicine has benefited tremendously. Um, we've gotten closer to the College of Law and Engineering and, and just having access to all of that breadth of knowledge there I think really has taken us out of our little secure health sciences nest and said, you know, you need to look further. And these new joint degrees are an example of that. I think that, you know, the merger was, was inevitable. I mean, and, uh, you know, you want one strong university in Toledo rather than two marginal ones. Um, but I do think the University of Toledo should, you know, remember that MCO was, was, was a separate institution and, you know, treat it differently than if it was, has all, had always been one. Paul Block, Jr. helped create the Medical College of Ohio. He nurtured it through the early years and helped it thrive and mature. At the same time, he was also raising his two young sons. So I had to share uh, my parent uh, with uh, this cause that he so believed in, which was to create a, a medical college for Toledo. And as a little boy, I certainly wondered why is this so important to him? What is so important about a medical college? Um, having uh, grown up with MCO and, and realizing that, um, you know, that it, it has become um, quite, quite a, an institution, um, I wouldn't want to imagine Toledo today without uh, you know, physician training, without the biomedical research, without many great faculty members who came to Toledo because of MCO. And so I had to share my father and my childhood with MCO. And I think it was worth it. Many individuals have left their mark on the history of the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo, and the school has certainly left its mark on the lives of those who served there. I think that Medical College of Ohio played a pivotal role in, in, in giving me uh, what I needed the most, a good education, a good training and then a place to practice and also to continue to provide the facilities for my intellectual growth as a surgeon, as a physician and as a citizen. I, I really have a passion for this place and I'm um, and happy that I'm able to talk with people about it because that first class, some of us are still around. We had um, a little reunion a few months ago and somebody said, well, how many were there? And I said, three. And they said, well, three? That's not much. I said, that's 10% of our class. <laughs> I always, I've always said that, you know, everybody should have an opportunity to start a new medical school once and I think uh, and that's a lesson that, that people need I think more people need to learn in life that that uh, you can't always have the outcome that you thought you were going to get and, and and sometimes it turns out to be uh, uh, a lot better than you thought it was going to be.